Good evening, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the great privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College, where the American dream continues to come true, both online and on campus, as it has in the 150 years since our founding. I am so pleased to welcome you tonight to this virtual Roosevelt House discussion on one of the most critical topics of our time, covered in the new book by Hunter political scientist Zachary Shirky. U.S. foreign policy and the failure of force. But before we begin tonight's program, I want to extend my gratitude in this season of Thanksgiving to the Hunter community, our students, our faculty, and staff for tirelessly continuing our proud tradition of education and excellence even during this challenging time of the pandemic. We are especially thankful for the Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House Harold Hoser, a great Lincoln scholar whose leadership has helped make Roosevelt House a national center for civic discourse at this time when we have needed it the most. And we are so grateful to you, our Hunter alums and our friends, our community, for remaining connected with us through this virtual programming and for your moral and your financial support that has uplifted us during this pandemic. Now, as we approach Giving Tuesday, I hope all of you will consider a gift to Roosevelt House to help us continue these important programs and conversations and to make sure this treasured landmark is preserved in its usual superb condition until it is safe for us to gather there in person again. Last week, Roosevelt House offered a fascinating opportunity to re-examine another of our nation's deeply fought, fraught periods, delivering a brand new perspective on the historic conference at Yalta that convened the world's most powerful leaders for the planning of post-World War II peace. That program covered the new book by Catherine Grace Katz, The Daughters of Yalta, The Churchills, Roosevelt's, and Harriman's, A Story of Love and War. Please look for it on Hunter On Demand if you are not able to tune in. Tonight's topic picks up on the same theme of international affairs and the effort for peace, but it does so with an eye toward tomorrow and engages the scholarly contributions of the Hunter College faculty of which we are so proud. It is my pleasure to celebrate this new book by the chair of the Hunter College Political Science Department and one of the two stars of the Hunter faculty, Dr. Zachary Shirky. Professor Shirky's prior books include Uncertainty, Threat, and International Security, Implications for Southeast Asia with Ivan Savick, and Joining the Fray, Military Intervention in Civil Wars. In addition to his groundbreaking scholarship and books, Professor Shirky is one of Hunter's great teachers, leaders, and mentors. He has ably steered our vibrant and vocal political science department over recent months, and under his direction, the faculty have diligently helped the Hunter community and the broader public to better understand the factors affecting the presidential elections, and our students and graduates have lent their expertise and their voices to generate awareness and help get out the vote. Zachary is an extraordinary role model for our budding scholars, researchers, lawyers, policy wonks, and activists, and no one better exemplifies our historic hunter motto, mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. Zachary, thank you for your devotion to our students as well as your groundbreaking work as a scholar. With his new book, American Dove, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Failure of Force, Professor Shirky makes another significant contribution to the ongoing conversation on American engagement abroad. In it, he rigorously interrogates one of the most crucial questions facing our country, that of how to approach international conflict in a manner most likely to achieve established goals. Happily, his answer, rooted in extensive and expansive research, as well as an acute sense of American values, brings with it the potential for a future both more prosperous and less violent. Carefully placing our current foreign policy in perspective, American Dove delivers a foreign strategy that is not only more peaceful, but more purposeful. To discuss this essential new book with Zachary, we are delighted to welcome back to Roosevelt House, albeit virtually, Dr. Gideon Rose. 
Gideon Rose is a longtime editor of the influential journal Foreign Affairs based at the Council on Foreign Relations. I am sure many of you know Gideon Rose as a regular, insightful, and thoughtful contributor to print and television conversations. Simply, he is one of our great pundits. Gideon is the author of How Wars End, Fight the Last Battle. His work as an editor and writer is informed by significant experience in the highest levels of government, including service on the staff of the National Security Council during the Clinton administration. And Gideon has taught American foreign policy at both Princeton and Columbia. As part of the team at the Council on Foreign Relations, Gideon's office is just a couple of blocks from Roosevelt House and Hunter, and we could not be happier to recreate that neighborliness tonight over Zoom. Gideon, you and your quintessential New York Rose family have contributed so much over the decades to the city as leaders, real estate visionaries, and philanthropists, and you also exemplify the Hunter motto of caring for the future. We are so glad to have you as a regular participant at Roosevelt House and so pleased you could be with us here tonight. There simply could not be a better person to join Zachary Shirky in addressing this pivotal subject. So welcome Dr. Zachary Shirky and Gideon Rose for this important conversation and thank you all for being part of the Hunter Roosevelt House family. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jennifer, it's it's del I'm delighted to be here, and that's really for those very kind words. Uh, I'm Gideon Rose, the editor of Foreign Affairs, and it is my distinct pleasure to uh, be able to be here with you guys tonight to discuss a wonderful new book by uh, a great scholar and leading voice on these topics, um, Zachary Shirky. So. The book is called American Dove, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Failure of Force. I'm going to play devil's advocate and get into the it and scruff them up uh, for your delectation and edification. Uh, but we'll start with the softball. Uh, Zachary, what is the pricey of your argument uh, for those who have not yet read the book? What is the core argument you're making? Sure. So uh, thank you for the introduction as well to, to President Rob. Um, so my argument is that the U.S. Um, has become overly enamored with the use of force as a foreign policy tool. But it's not an argument that force never makes sense. It's not an argument uh, for pacifism or, or disarmament, but rather that the U.S. Is, uh, uses force actively far too often, uh, especially um, in the post-Cold War period. The U.S. has used force um, almost every year. Um, even going back to the last, say, 100 years, the U.S. has used force um, more often than not. Uh, and so there's problems here, right? One, obviously, it's hard to win a war. You have, uh, I go through the book, some of the challenges um, of actually winning wars. But the U.S. has a quite powerful military. The U.S. is able to do that, right? So the real problem isn't winning tactically. The real problem is simply winning battles doesn't necessarily get you the political outcomes you want. Right? The point of any foreign policy tool is to achieve your political goals, uh, and whether that's um, force or any other tool. And force, as it turns out, um, isn't always the best tool. In fact, it's often the wrong tool. Uh, it's like if you own a hammer and you see every home improvement project as though it's a nail, you end up putting a lot of holes in the wall, uh, breaking mirrors, things that aren't right. You're not doing what you're looking to do here. And so there's a couple of reasons why um, force fails. Uh, one reason is that simply winning battles doesn't give you that outcome. So if you think about Iraq or Libya or Afghanistan, right, you are still um, engaged in, 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 in Afghanistan after it was now 19 years. Simply winning battles doesn't bring about that uh, stable Iraq, stable Afghanistan. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, you can, right, if you think about in Libya and Iraq, uh, U.S. military involvement there created openings for ISIS. Uh, led to the rise of ISIS in both locations, right, has led to an ongoing civil war in Libya, led to a lo long civil war in Iraq, has increased Iranian influence in Iraq, right, these are outcomes that are contrary to U.S. goals and preferences, right, no one sort of before the U.S. invaded Iraq said, ah, what I want is to create a new front for an Al-Qaeda-like group and to increase Iranian influence in the Middle East, right, that, that's no one's goal, and so, right, this, and in, in, in because force is so costly, 
you really need it to bring about the goals you want, right? If it's not bringing about the goals, it's a very, very costly way to fail. Um, so that's one problem. Another big problem is that a lot of foreign policy goals have nothing to do with force. Uh, I think that's fairly easy to address, right? So you want to um, improve economic strength at home, uh, right? Get better trade deals, address climate change. Force just doesn't help there, right? That's that's just the wrong tool um, for that question. Um, and then last, and I think in some ways um, most devilishly, using force sets precedence, right? The U.S. Um, as a very powerful country, as a very visible country, what it does changes um, sort of the permissive environment for other countries. So if you want to condemn Russian in, in involvement in Ukraine, right, um, annexing Crimea, using Russian forces um, to meddle in eastern Ukraine, uh, you can't condemn that use of force while you're involved in other countries. I mean, you can, but it just looks highly hypocritical. Right? It's not very effective, right? People say, well, why can you do it if we can't, right? So, you know, Turkish involvement in Syria becomes more permissible. Given that the U.S. in many ways is a deeply status quo power, right? The U.S. doesn't have territorial ambitions. It doesn't want a highly revisionist world. Uh, making it easier for other countries to engage in that sort of behavior undermines U.S. interests uh, long-term interests, right? So the U.S., um, by actively using force, is potentially making the world a more dangerous place. Uh, the other um, sort of two parts of the book is one, I, I argue that other tools work quite well, right? So what the U.S. has done by focusing on force, it's ignored economic tools, whether that's foreign aid, um, inducements to better behavior through trade, investment, uh, potentially sanctions, uh, is ignored uh, use of international law. The U.S. generally follows international law, but the U.S. has ceased to invest in new international law, right? The Senate hasn't passed um, a great many, uh, you know, a raft of international treaties that are sort of sitting in Senate cubbyholes that haven't been ratified. Um, the U.S. has backed away from the use of international organizations, right? Put less effort into using the U.N., put less effort into, right? So for instance, um, rather than saying, um, the WHO needed to, to perform better fighting the global pandemic, um, basically just said, yep, we don't like you, we're out. And just sort of ceded the field um, to China, which with predictable results that you have a WHO, uh, that basically just sort of parrot the Chinese line. Um, and what's surprising is we might, might think of these as sort of nice tools, things that maybe, you know, um, cuddly countries would do, but in fact, right, um, a lot of countries use these tools to good effect. So not just EU member states, uh, but right, the Chinese have invested heavily along with other BRICS powers in either gaining more influence in places like the uh, World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund or creating rival organizations right, to in, in, enhance their influence. Uh, you know, same with India, same with Russia. Um, so countries that in some ways are in much more dangerous environments in the United States often use force less often. That should suggest to us that we don't have to use force anywhere near as often as we do, right? So if, if countries in more dangerous places say, well, you know, this maybe isn't the best tool, um, that again, I think suggests uh, that the US could use force less often. Uh, the last part of my, my, my argument in the book is that doves have gone about these sort of arguments really, really poorly. That, that doves have um, been their own worst enemies in many ways in arguing against the use of force. Um, doves have done a couple of things that are foolish. One, doves have often sort of made blame America arguments, right? And this is not a great way to influence Americans. Running around calling in the United States um, imperialistic or evil or warmonger, that, that turns people off, right? The idea of an argument is to win people over. Um, if you start by insulting them, um, if you start by sort of, you know, insulting the military, which is quite popular, um, that's a bad way to go. Um, I think also doves have made a mistake of emphasizing costs, right? They say war is costly, which is absolutely true, um, right? War is the most expensive thing probably a country can do, in, certainly in terms of lives, but also in terms of money. War costs a ton of money. But if people are willing to use force and back force, if people think that's the best way to achieve US foreign policy goals, they're often willing to pay significant costs. So point out to them, it's expensive. They're like, well, I know it's expensive, but I think it's gonna work. Doves would do much better making the argument that in fact, 
force isn't going to get the to the outcome, right? So if you say invading Iraq, if you say invading Iraq, don't do it. It's expensive. It's going to cost lives. That doesn't win people over. If instead you say invading Iraq is not going to give us a more secure Middle East, it's going to create a bunch of chaos, leave us sucked in there, it's not going to get the outcome you want. That's a more convincing way to do it. So a good argument will frame um, the argument against the use of force and for other tools in terms of American values like honor and strength. Um, it's fine to point out that it's actually pro-military, not asking people to kill and be killed is, is generally a good positive thing for those individuals, right? So arguing for a more peaceful foreign policy is in no way um, anti-military. So I think if Dobbs frame their arguments better in terms of strategy um, as consistent with American values, um, they'll do better. Obviously it doesn't guarantee success. Any policy argument um, is always difficult, has people on the other side, but I think a better framing, a better way of stating the argument um, would very much help those um, who would like to see the US use force less often. Thank you very much. It's a great summary. Uh, this all sounds very reasonable. If, why do you need to write a book about it? Why isn't it already policy? Who are the insane or motivated or nefarious people uh, driving policy into all these unnecessary military cul-de-sacs when we obviously could avoid uh, all the problems of the world by adopting your advice. Right, so um, obviously, right, if I have to write a book, it's, it's not necessarily um, obvious on the face, right? It's, so fair enough. Um, I also don't think people are advocating this out of nefarious purposes or things like that. I think they generally believe forceful work, right? There's a couple reasons why I think people get drawn in this direction. Um, the U.S. military is a very powerful, awesome tool. You'll look at it and say, wow, that's a great thing. Let me use that, right? I mean, this was um, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, right, complaining, you, know, you have this great thing. Why can't I use it? Why are you telling me I shouldn't use this tool? Um, so there's a temptation when you have something that looks very powerful to not think about, you know, is it actually going to give me what I want? Yes, it's very powerful in a tactical sense on the battlefield. But right, the goal is the politics and linking those battlefield victories to the outcomes is difficult. And I think it's tempting to, uh, it's possible to miss that. Uh, also, right, if you think about a lot of, um, there's been some psychological research on human biases and people tend to assume they have more control than they do. Um, they tend to have biases towards taking action rather than being reactive. That's more comfortable. Um, there's a nice sort of study, right, that um, uh, goalkeepers in soccer, right, like to, um, defending a penalty kick, will, will jump before they know which way the ball is going, even though studies routinely show that's actually suboptimal, but it looks like they're taking action, right? So there's this temptation to want to do something. Um, peaceful policies often are slower. Um, they may be less visible. Uh, and so I think there's this seduction to, you know, I want to do something. I want to be a force for good. I know I have this powerful military. Let me go do that rather than thinking through, well, what happens if it doesn't work? Is this really the best option? Um, it, it's the most obvious option, but that doesn't, doesn't make it the best option. So I think that's what I'm, I don't think it's nefarious uh, in, in any way. I, I think it's people trying to advance US interests, but Got it. Uh, so it seems like you could cast this argument in a strong form or a weak form, a liberal form or a radical form. You said that force is like a hammer. Uh, the liberal or the weak form could be, okay, you really don't want to use that hammer carelessly or swing it around and put it on a top shelf or if it put the ax for the fire uh, behind glass and say only break in case of glass, put your gun with a safety lock on a back shelf under lock and key, keep it away from the kids or people involved in a domestic argument. In that case, to the extent that you're arguing that, what you're calling for strikes me as a very prudent, sensible foreign policy that avoids, as you say at one point in the book, stupid and unnecessary wars. Uh, and what you're really saying is people haven't been as serious as they should be about trying to get 
not get into stupid unnecessary wars and they have actually gotten into stupid unnecessary wars and if we just prune back some of the more silly choices and impulsive choices we can continue with much of american foreign policy in a much less militaristic fashion another more radical thing is hey you guys have are addicted to using this hammer it is a rare, very rare tool that should only be, you know, allowed under strict prescriptions by a group of, you know, public health officials like the UN. And the entire notion that a bunch of crazy Americans, just by some accident of history with the world's largest military can and should go around with the option to use force whenever they want, relying merely on the self-restraint of prudent people who could be convinced by rational arguments like yours is not enough to stop the problem. It hasn't stopped it in the past and won't in the future. And we need something much more, much stronger, either to bind ourselves or to uh, uh, check the, the, the powers or forces that would lead us into war, et cetera. So, you know, put the, how, are you just saying be careful with the hammer? Or are you saying that hammer is like a toxic waste thing that the, the ring of Sauron that has to be taken and dropped into Mount Doom yeah. because anybody who picks up the hammer will be corrupted by it. I, I, I'm probably not an, I'm, I'm certainly not all the way to it's a corrupting throw, you know, melt the hammer. I think you want to retain the US military, but I think you want to set very clear limits on when you would use it. I think you want to use the military, especially, certainly in any large fashion, to defend US allies, to defend their territory. Uh, to defend obviously U.S. territory, right? If you if you say the military is to deter attacks on ourselves and on our friends, in pretty much full stop. There may be small exceptions, right? You may have to use the Marines if, let's say, you've got to rescue people from an embassy as there's a country collapsing, right? You know, maybe there's the odd Bin Laden raid. You know, small. You know, but overall, you're using it in these very limited circumstances, right? To protect the territorial integrity of the United States and its allies. Um, in pretty much full stop there. So that's not throwing the hammer away, but but it, maybe it is a you know break break the glass kind of kind of situation. Um, on the broader part of you know how do you restrain that? Well, that's democracy, right? You have ongoing arguments about what policy should be. Um, Americans aren't going to say we'll only use force or only do X, Y, and Z if the UN says it's okay. I don't think you can ever. I don't think that's a winning argument. So I, I think you just have to constantly fight the policy argument and win. Got it. Uh, the uh, the question to go back to the hammer question. Well, no. When you want, you say defend allies. Yeah. Ourselves and allies. Often, when that has been done or when you are restoring, uh, when, you are, when you are called upon to live up to your promises to do that, after somebody has done something bad to violate you or your allies, there comes a time, often in American wars, when you've gotten to the starting line, you've gotten back to ground zero, you've gotten up to the 38th parallel, yep. you've gotten up to the border of Kuwait, You've repelled the force. You've done what you would argue in many respects or consistent with what you're arguing is a legitimate use of force to protect and defend American allies against external militarized attack, the one kind of thing. But at that point, you're faced with this question that I want to press you on, which is what exactly do you do at that point to guarantee that it doesn't happen again? And there's two options. There's the Korea option or the Iraq option in the 90s, which is you just garrison the border forever and accept that you're never going to change the North or you're never going to change Iraq. But that means in order to protect Kuwait, protect South Korea, protect Europe, you have to constantly man the garrison, uh, the black, you know, the, 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 the nice watch permanently on the borders forever. The argument for going forward would be that if you could in some way make the country next door not the type that invades, then you wouldn't have to do this. And there have been times in history you did that with the Germans. If you did it with the Germans, why can't you do it with the North Koreans or 
the Iraqis or whatever. That would be the argument against. What's your argument back to that? So it would be, it, it's always, yes, this is the great temptation. Why can't I fix the world? Because it's beyond our ability to fix the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's the great temptation. Uh, you know, if I could only, right, you know, the, the Romans wanted, you know, if you could just get to the end of the island, you wouldn't need Hadrian's Wall south of Scotland, but, you know, right, but, you know, you can't, right, um, there's studies, so, uh, of sort of empires would often say, well, we've got a turbulent border, let's just solve that, turns out what they got after that is another turbulent border, um, a little bit after, a little further on, um, with another war. Uh, if you think about, you know, which would you rather had, uh, the, the Iraq war from 2003 to, you know, or, you know, garrison the Korean peninsula. And in fact, at this point, right, the South Koreans really don't need, um, on a conventional sense, our help garrison the Korean peninsula. We're, we're, we're you know, we, we contribute, but we don't really need to be there in a strictly tactical sense. Um, you talk about um, reforming Germany and Japan, certainly, right, post-World War II. Um, World War II is the deadliest war in human right world war ii is an exception we should not formulate normal foreign policy with world war ii as the model uh, world war ii's happen but they don't happen that often um and right you talk about concurrently garrison we still have troops in japan and germany so if you don't want to garrison things forever i'm not in high i mean and i don't i'm not actually opposed to having troops in germany i think that actually that's a, a useful uh, thing to do right you can have troops deployed abroad um and allies and not actively use force but if the idea is that you right, well, we you know you win and you never need um, force again, eh, that's not clear. That's that's right to me that you can't. The world remains a dangerous place. Um, you can't make you right. So you there's two things you can't do in foreign policy. You can't fix the world. That's beyond U.S. power. As awesome as U.S. power appears to be at times, and you can't run away from the world. You can't say, well, I don't like the world. I'm going to hide from it and they'll leave me alone. That doesn't work either, right? You can neither reform um, nor hide from the world. You can just do the best um, with what you got. Okay. I agree entirely for what it's worth, what little it's worth. Uh, and I want to take you now into the graduate version, which is the specific implementation. It's okay. all nice to say this kind of thing. Now let's get to the details of what you would do or would not do. Because in the end of the day, it all comes down to, would you do something differently if we followed your advice than the other guy? Because otherwise, just an argument. And if not, why so? So it all comes down to what you would do differently than others. You line up three options of disposable uh, uh, operations, as it were, or issues to care about. I like this very much. So like the Marie Kondo approach to American foreign policy. Uh, only what's necessary and useful for the use of force uh, and, and get rid of the other stuff. And three of the areas that you suggest we should have lowered sights in are the active spreading of American values, uh, certainly at the point of a gun, uh, the interference with other countries' domestic political arrangements or the caring about those or desire to order their domestic arrangements, and peripheral regions that aren't really necessary, i.e. for the larger structures of power in American foreign policy. So the argument, the practical argument, in addition to be wise uh, and prudential, by the way, all of which is true, and I wrote an entire book, which everyone yelled at me for the end, uh, which was basically, you go to war without thinking about how and why you're gonna wrap it up and do it, and you make the same stupid mistakes every time, and it's not caused by anything except the lack of discipline of the civilian policymakers at the top. So I agree entirely with this, but it is kind of an unsatisfying answer, which is we just have to be better. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're feeling like to be more in a few good men, you know, I, I really object, right? You know, like be smarter this time, damn it. But that said, there are uh, the three areas that you suggest pruning back on are the values and the regions and the domestic arrangements. What, that's gonna come as a cost because all that suggests that there are some things you won't fight for, some things you won't promote. And, I'll, and those are where the rubber hits the road uh, because people will object. And the reason I would say that a lot of the policymakers in office can't do what you want them to do. What they would themselves would often want to do is because they feel impelled to, as you say, do something. And it's often do something in an area that is they know is less than crucial, but either they believe in a broken windows theory of the world, 
and they have to stop it now, or they just feel compelled to avoid the political heat. Let's say Taiwan. You know, China is Taiwan is right now sitting between the United States and uh, China, and it is probably the single greatest geopolitical flashpoint going forward that you could imagine a U.S.-China war occurring over. Yeah. Uh, it would be very easy to avoid that war. It would be very easy to, uh, 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 you know, if you just basically allowed some kind of Finlandization or, you know, actual, you know, sort of shift over from Taiwan. That's what the Chinese say, we don't want anything more, just that. And if you're gonna say, I'm gonna defend Taiwan like an ally, uh, then, then you might well go to war with China. How do you use your policy? What is your Taiwan policy? So, yeah. So uh, two things. So before I get to the, my, my my Taiwan policy, which you know, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with promoting American values as far as promoting them. Just don't do it at the point of a gun, right? You can do it with other tools, or rhetoric, aid. I think there's nothing wrong with having a value-driven foreign policy. Just don't shoot people over it. Um, so so I, I'm not I'm not you know. There's some people who argue for sort of a retrenchment. Don't advocate U.S. Value. I'm not for that. I don't think you can sell that at home. Uh, Americans aren't going to go for that. Um, I don't want to go for that. I, I want to promote human rights. I just don't want to do it at the point of a gun. Um, as far as a Taiwan policy, right? I mean, obviously this is tricky. I mean, it's been tricky since since the Chinese Civil War, right? And there's a uh, anecdote where um, Eisenhower, towards the end of his presidency, um, his aides were concerned that he was going to get pinned down on if he would or would not defend Taiwan. And if he would defend Taiwan, does it embolden Taiwan? If he wouldn't, does it embolden mainland China? He says, don't worry, I'll just act confused if they try to pin me down, which he could sort of do towards the end of his, believably towards the end of his presidency. Uh, to me, I, you know, I think you can, as the United States, say Taiwan is an ally. The U.S. hasn't fully wanted to do that. But then you would say we are committed to defend it. And if we would do so, we would use the full force of the U.S. military and so on. Um, and then, right, deterrence can work. Uh, deterrence worked in Europe in the Cold War, right? If you if you come down and say we will, right, the Chinese don't want a war with us any more than we want a war with the Chinese. No, no one wants that war. That war is bad for. Maybe it's good for the Russians, but it's bad for everybody, as far as I can see. Uh, certainly, you know, the U.S. and the Chinese. So you could rely on deterrence. Say Taiwan is worth fighting for, and say you know, and then deter the Chinese. The harder thing, I think, is what is in the middle. Well, what if it's not an invasion, right? It's, I think it's I think it's entirely possible to deter an amphibious invasion on Taiwan. The harder thing is, what if there's sort of this soft opening where you know the Chinese are happy to bring the Taiwanese slow? That you probably have to sort of leave up to the Taiwanese people, and if they're willing to make that move, you, you know, you accept that. I, I, so I think that's how I would try to. You know, thread the needle. Taiwanese policy, yeah, I, I think is one of the harder things to do. Okay, good. I got one for you. Another one. We'll go around the world. Spin right. the globe. Okay. This one, I thought this was simple at the time, and nobody else agreed with me, and it's come now enshrined in American foreign policy. So, okay. We had this thing called NATO, which drew this line, and then we had this thing called NATO enlargement, which pushed the line further out. Right. There were still some countries left beyond that. And Russia decided to screw with one of those countries beyond that, Ukraine. Yep. Ukraine was beyond the wall. Our commitments were to people within the wall. Yep. When Russia went after Ukraine, everybody said we have to go after this without, as if the wall didn't exist, as if it was about Russia, as if it was symmetrical rather than asymmetrical containment in tenant terms. Do you let Ukraine just go and say, hey, I don't care about democracy there. I don't care about the Russian influence there. I don't care about the reform movements of the color revolutions in the FSU. We're going back to John Quincy Adams. We're well wishers. We'll send you some pamphlets and give you some internet like tweets and you know yeah. support with crying eyes when you when you get when your revolution gets snuffed out. But don't count on America anymore because our our moral compass is now limited in practice to the wall. So Again, I think um, I, I think I would not use force to defend Ukraine. That's not a war I want to fight. I, it's be, as you said, it's beyond the wall. You know whether the NATO expansion went to the right level or not. I mean, it's there. It's hard. You can't bring it back once you put it out, which is one reason not to put it out in the begin with further than you want to. You want to think about that closely. But once it's out there, it is there. Um, I you know, and I actually right again. You can use these other tools. You can use um, aid to prop up the Ukrainian government if you don't want to fight and die for the Ukrainians, which I think is perfectly reasonable. 
but also not just let them fall, right? You can use rhetoric. You can use threats of economic retaliation against the Russians. Uh, and you obviously you get what you have, which is not a wonderful outcome, right? You have a slow, similar in civil war, um, not super intense, but people are dying in, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, but you have, um, you know, 90% of Ukraine is, is an independent state, um, somewhat democratic, right? It's not, you know, if you were to ask Putin, is this a wonderful outcome that he got? Probably not. I think it's, you know, Putin sort of same kind of tough questions. You know, he used force, but he's stuck there now, right? W which, which end of this stick would you rather have? Putin's stick where he's stuck in Eastern Ukraine or, or the U.S. stick where we're not stuck in Ukraine. And in fact, in many ways, right, what's left of Ukraine turns more West now because the Russians by invading have pushed them away. So I, I don't, I think a lot of people see this as some great Russian victory. Um, I, I'm not sure that's a great way to interpret um, what's happened in Ukraine. It's, 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 a, it's a middling outcome. It's a, you know, it's, I, I have a colleague who basically argues foreign policy is often choosing between two bad options and you choose the least bad one. Um, that's often, you know, you can't get what you ideally want a lot of the time and, and sort of accepting that is a, is an important part of foreign policy. Uh, I, yeah, I'm on, I agree entirely. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, you started writing this book when? Oh boy. Um, that must be maybe 2015, 2016. Okay, so you started writing this at the height of, or still when we were trapped in the forever wars and everything was still like my, the instinctive reaction with the knee jerk death. Are we, has, has history, the failure and you know, Iraq and Afghanistan syndrome and Donald Trump achieved your goals and now that the book is coming out, are we already at the tail end of the American empire uh, inoculated against future stupid wars by massive popular rejection of the foreign policies that brought them about and the elites that uh, that cheerleaded for them. That would be lovely. Um, uh, my guess is no. Um, I, I, know, I mean, you want to think, so think about Vietnam syndrome, right? Vietnam syndrome leads to uh, less use of U.S. force in the late 70s. Um, maybe a little bit in the early, but then right, it, it comes back again. So I think people remember for a while, um, you know, I think it's much, you know, I don't think the US is gonna do an invasion of Iraq style use of force um, anytime soon. I, I, don't, I don't think the app, one that's an immediate post 9-11 period. I mean, that's a, you know, but could you do more Libyas? Sure. Could you, could you do drone strikes and send munitions to, to Yemen and get sucked into a war like Yemen? Yeah. So I think the danger is not um, a full scale invasion like Iraq. Um, or, or, or even Afghanistan. I think the danger is, you know, what we can do, air, you know, right, the U.S. doesn't take casualties in Libya, really. Um, it's sort of, you know, offshore airstrikes and things like that, but it, it's not clear that you end up in a better spot, right? You have a destabilized Libya, um, you know, a, a haven for ISIS for a while. Um, you know, people who might ultimately replace Gaddafi, maybe just as unattractive as Gaddafi. It's not clear that, I think that's the danger. I think it's these smaller, mid-sized uses of force um, that, that are really the danger, right? Um, right, we're, we're happy to use, you know, uh, assassinate our, uh, Iranian generals on Iraqi soil with, with a strike. Uh, you know, in, in those things can, can get away from you um, or lead to retaliation. So I think that's the danger. I don't think the danger is a full scale, let's drive on Baghdad kind of thing, at least not for the next 15, 10, 15 years. Now, 20 years from now, I don't know. People have forgotten. Uh we have a lot of people here who want to get in on this conversation and ask you stuff themselves, and I want to get to them in the time we have remaining. But I want to ask one last question, which is, as I was reading this, it, I, I kept thinking not just how much sense it made, but also how much it overlapped in its perspective and viewpoint and advice, frankly, with uh, Bob Gates's memoirs, mm -hmm. the most recent uh, memoirs, which I just reviewed actually over the, the earlier in the summer. And he essentially put out a kind of conservative internationalism that essentially heavily shift, would heavily shift the burden towards the non-military tools in the toolkit, whether it was diplomacy or foreign aid or humanitarian aid yeah. and so forth, and restrict the 
uh, use of force to cases. Uh, uh, he actually put it, uh, uh, he quoted his, uh, a guru of his who said that the military strategy should be never fight unless you have to, never fight alone and never fight for long. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, here is Bob Gates, you know, saying this. Uh, it, the, I think a lot of your advice precisely because it is sensible and rational uh, and meets the needs of the situation and the tools available, overlaps with or dovetails with what many, much of the technocratic best practices inside uh, the military industrial complex actually is. I think yeah. people misunderstand ever since Eisenhower, maybe there were a lot of big structural drivers then and certainly the availability issues uh, that you say, if you have a hammers lying around, it's easy to pick them up. So we need gun control for the hammers at least. Uh, but the the having those tools available, the people who least want to use them and certainly least use them badly are the people involved. And the you know, a lot of the drivers for the stuff you're talking about are not the military command, but the civilian leadership mm -hmm. that short circuits clear decision-making processes uh, and good technocratic uh, decision making. And I wonder, just before I turn it over to the audience, do you think we've just seen several years in which the entire notion of sort of professionalism and technocratic competence and rational policy making, according to evidence based policy making, you might call it, uh, with rational expectations of calculations of future expected value, uh, has not been in evidence in American foreign policy, shall we say? Do you think it is possible as we go forward that there will be a return inside the American government to the kind of rational calculations and attempted argumentative thinking and discourse that would enable arguments like yours to win the day? I, I, I think so. I mean, I don't, I mean, you can, like, as you mentioned, you can have a sort of a liberal or a more conservative dovish argument. Um, I don't think that, you know, I, uh, foreign policy professionals aren't necessarily um, hawkish. Some are, some are not. They vary. Um, same with the military. I, I think you can return to that. Uh, I would guess a, a Biden administration, um, I'm not sure that they'll be dovish, um, but I would think they would want to return to sort of, um, you know, that sort of kind of best practices calculation, whether that in their mind leads to dovishness or not, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I think it's, you know, far too early to say, you know, it hasn't put together a foreign policy team or anything like that. Um, I would also say the one sort of thing I argue that's maybe a little bit different than Gates is I think you really do have to inject um, a values element into this. That if you sort of have a sort of a, um, a, a sort of cold rationalist, maybe realist, if you know the political science term of that, uh, foreign policy, it's, it's easily subverted by sort of a, um, either a neoconservatism or a, a hawkish liberal internationalism. So you know, someone from either like a Don Rumsfeld or, um, right, Samantha Power is quite happy to use force on the other end of the political spectrum, where they say, well, we want to do something, we want to advance American values, and we can do that at a barrel of a gun. If you don't have that, you, you have to, ha you can't just sort of have a bloodless dovishness. I think that just doesn't sell. I think you just lose. That you, you have to point out how you're advancing um, American values. That, but in doing that, I think it's possible to create a foreign policy that would appeal a long ways across the political spectrum. That there's there's conservatives and liberals, if it's advancing US values, but doing so in a way that's not getting us sucked into a bunch of wars and uses of force, I think that can be sold broadly. As my people say, from your lips to God's ears. Uh, at this point, let's uh, bring in uh, some of our other participants. That got a smile. Uh, let's get, uh, uh, let's bring in some questions from the audience. Uh, over to you guys. Hey, Gideon. Hey, Zachary. The conversation has inspired lots of good questions, and I'll share some, some of them with you now. They are mostly targeted at Zachary. Gideon, you should also feel free to chime in, though. Um, um, so the first question from Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Andrew Polsky. One reason the US has leaned heavily on force is that the rest of the foreign policy toolkit has been woefully underfunded. Foreign aid is deeply unpopular. How do you get Congress to fund other tools besides the military? Yeah, this is, is a, a really good, important question. I don't just say that because it's from my, from my boss. Um, 
but yeah, right. You, you clearly, if you don't invest in these other things, right. So if you have an anemic, uh, right. So the state department has been hollowed out, um, USAID, which oversees us, um, economic aid has been hollowed out. If you don't have other tools available, you have a real problem. And so you know, one of the key things is to rebuild these, uh, and this is tricky. You have to make the argument to Congress. I think there's ways to do this, um, right? A lot of foreign aid gets spent at home, point out to members of Congress that some of this aid is actually going to be spent in their district, right? If you're sending food aid or expertise, oftentimes, right, what's purchased is purchased in the United States. Um, you have to have a president who argues for it, right? One of the ways that, right, you know, if presidents don't go down and say, I need these things, so if they just sort of half say it in uh, you know, foreign policy circles, it doesn't get paid attention to, right? Presidents would have to devote political capital. Uh, members of Congress who um, prefer these outcomes would have to devote political capital. One of the problems, of course, uh, in U.S. political discourse is foreign policy is often shunted to the side, uh, right? Other things take priority. Uh, and again, I think you advocate it in sort of a, a way that you're not anti-military. I think if you sell this, we don't like the military, we're doing this, that's a good way to lose on Capitol Hill. Um, the military has lots of friends on Capitol Hill. Um, but right, uh, Robert Gates went before Congress and said, take away some of my budget, give it to the State Department. No one does that. No one says, take away my budget and give it elsewhere, uh, which tells you how much it's needed. I mean, I agree, this, is, this maybe is in some ways the fundamental challenge. How do you get the budget shifted so that these other tools are more robust. I, and I think it's, I think it's really hard. Um, I wish I could summon maybe one of my colleagues who's an expert on Congress on how to do this. Um, yeah, I, it's, 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 I wish I had a better answer to how to do it, but it's, it's certainly vital to do it. Here's a question from Joan Fabio, a friend of Roosevelt House. She says, since Dove has a weak and negative connotation, wouldn't a better characterization be pragmatist? I would. So perhaps, though I think pragmatists might say, what, what's wrong with force, right? I think a pragmatist says, I just weigh when force, now I conclude that force doesn't work very often, but there's lots of people who would argue they're pragmatic and quite happy to use force, right? There's hawks who say, well, I'm a pragmatic, right? Uh, there used to be, there was a political science that said they were owls, right? They were neither doves nor hawks, they were owls. Um, and, and so, I'm making a stronger argument again. I'm not just saying, you know, let's be clever. I, I'm saying force doesn't work an awful lot of the time that, that you really want to limit what you're doing. Um, I do think there's this problem where doves have been portrayed as being weak and naive. And I, I actually try to make an argument in the book that hawks are actually fairly naive. They think this tool is going to work all the time. Um, and so uh, there's this tendency to see the field the hawk, well, if you're really smart and hard-headed, you, you, you know you've got to use the military. Uh, and, and I just don't think that's right. I'm actually very glad that Zach is, I agree with the questioner and I also agree with Zach's answer because I think Zach is trying to open the Overton window and push it out more for the use of the term dove. I think it's not going to be successful because people still will find it a weak term, but having good, serious, strong arguments try to reclaim it as a legit term and a legit position rather than that squishy little wet thing uh, that, that, that wimps do is very good for everybody. Uh, on the notion, by the way, about naming things mattering, I'll, uh, it's absolutely true. Uh, I realized that feminist theory was correct in important ways about 25 years ago when I came up with an international relations theory offshoot of a variant uh, that ultimately was known as neoclassical realism. Uh, the first iteration was called soft realism. And when I presented my paper at APSA on soft realism, all the young male IR type A realist authors in the camp were so horrified at being called soft that they begged and swore me to change the name. And I ultimately had to get rid of it because they just, it, it was so, and I was like, guys, this, you're giving in to, you know, anyway, the fact is people do care about the, the, you know, the labels and Dove may not be ultimately the, the popular movement, uh, uh, but it's good to reclaim the word. And it, it, it may, and right, there's always the difference between say, um, what academic terms will I use in a book and what a, a practical everyday politician would use. I, I don't recommend that say uh, a senator necessarily use the term, but I think it's the right, correct term. So there's, 
you know, I'll see, I'll see labeling the practical politicians though. Professor C.A. Roberts um, makes an observation and then asks a question. Extended deterrence and war fighting require credible nuclear postures, threats to use nuclear weapons first in some cases and possibly major wars. Alliances commit the US to maintain robust military capabilities and postures. Do you favor limiting retrenching some US military commitments by agreeing to limited nuclear proliferation? Hmm, that's wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, so yeah, obviously, right, for deterrence to work, you need um, the capabilities to carry it out, right? You need the resolve to carry it out. Um, you know, one way to cut, if you wanted to cut costs, I think you could actually, um, and this this may displease certain people, right? You might say, right, the army is actually designed to project force into other countries. So you may, in certain places, rely more on nuclear deterrence than Navy, Air Force, but maybe depending where you're trying to turn, maybe it's the army. Um, as far as nuclear proliferation, um, I don't know that the U.S. Um, should advocate for the proliferation. Um, that said, I also don't know that we have to go um, all out to try to prevent it, right? If 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 your solution to well, it, right? So if you sort of say any chance of proliferation um, is terrible, we need to use force to prevent it. I would not favor that, right? I um, I think you can deter other nuclear powers with with nuclear weapons. That said, um, would I encourage say US friends to develop their own nuclear arsenal? Probably not. Um, I don't necessarily know. Um, I think nuclear deterrence works, but I'm not sure I necessarily want, you know, you know, a nuclear armed Germany, for instance. I'm not, I'm not sure that's something I'm looking forward to. I, I, I guess I would go with no on that. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a viable argument, right? That, you know, nuclear deterrence works. Um, but, you know, I, you know, you can also get, you know, things can get away with you from there. So I'm not sure I would encourage it, but I certainly wouldn't use force um, to prevent it. I would fall back on deterrence if, if another country that was a threat to the U.S. got it. Mac, let me give you my two cents on this one. Uh, I'm reluctant to tangle with Professor Roberts because she usually out-argues me. But uh, in, in this case, I, as I've gotten older, I've become quite radical on the nuclear front. And I've now retreated to something that's probably close to a minimal deterrence position. I see no evidence that the variations in uh, nuclear weaponry or policy have significant impacts on non-nuclear areas of military behavior or national strategy. I think they're very, very big insurance weapons delivering a very simple point. The, the few bombs in the basement have done just enough to deter things as the mass massive things. So I, I, I question the premise of how linked, uh, I think at this point, and I won't argue the point because we don't have time here, but I my thoughts at this point are that Nuclear weapons freeze everything in place for the great powers. And then you have a sort of stability instability paradox in which you don't need much to freeze great powers from going to war anymore, but uh, then everything else is just chaos below that. Um, let's see. Um, Martin Amder asks, or says, maybe I missed the point, but isn't one problem that it's easy to begin a war, but very difficult to get out, especially if the exit game is not thought out before going in? Yeah, I, I just go with yes. That's like, that's, I think that's exactly right. That it's very easy to get in and then, and then you can't get out or even if you get out, what have you left? Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I just go with yes. Yes, but, and the answer is, since we all know this, since it is so obvious, since anybody involved with anything like this has that point drilled into them early on in the process, what has to be explained is why you keep doing something that's stupid. Yeah. And the answer is that I came to, nobody else's answer, but my answer is that there is no fixed rigorous culture of serious intellectual decision-making and technocratic decision-making on the security side among the highest national command authority in the executive branch. That the military actually has a whole set of traditions. The bureaucracies down have whole sets of institutions that force decision making. But when you get up to the situation room, it's whatever the people in the room want and whatever the amateur who happens to have been elected by the other amateurs happens to want that day looking at the TV. And what you see as Gates says, the Trump 
administration has, Trump has been the most non-technocratic of any of president, uh, the most violating all his advisors and, and overruling them and playing favorites, but it's only in matters of degree, not kind. And that's the problem. And until we discipline the White House uh, and until that comes from self-restraint by people with character and competence at the top of the process and throughout the higher echelons, we're gonna be doomed to repeating on the, the process that Zach uh, keeps talking about. Jean, Jenna Russo asks, um, first she cites something I'm unfamiliar with, I apologize, called Pickering's argument that multiple unsuccessful military operations will lead to war weariness, not only with political elites, but also with the masses. And then asks, has the US developed a sense of war weariness following involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan? If not, why not? Her, I should mention her, her, she originally frames it as, why isn't a greater process of learning taking place? So, yeah, I mean, I think there is some war weariness. I, I, you know, one of the things, right, Trump campaigned on is having less war. I mean, you, you don't necessarily think of, I wouldn't call Trump a dove, but, you know, he, he you know, said he's going to bring, you know. It, so I think there is, is some of that. Um, one of the reasons you might think that there's less learning in somewhat in the U.S. is, right, most Americans don't pay the cost, right? You know, how many Americans serve in the military anymore or have family? It, it, it's, it's a small percentage. Um, how did the U.S. pay for the wars? Borrowing. So your taxes didn't go up. So, right, if you only learn things, if you learn things the hard way, right, things happen to you, is might actually indicate why there's not a ton of learning because right people didn't serve people didn't die and they're you know right it was paid for through borrowing so um that might lead to less learning but i think there is a, i mean right i mean there is a if you look at the um what 2006 midterm elections i mean the, part of that was it was decided on iraq not all of it but part of it right i think there's uh, there is some learning some more awareness uh, but it's not permanent Right. I think there's been overlearning in the public and underlearning in the elite. Um, uh, let's see. Professor Teen from the pl uh, political science department says, is warfare occurring more and more online, subverting elections, spreading disinformation, disrupting e-commerce, et cetera, waged, of course, by America too? If yes, it seems it is something the public is largely unaware of. So how can citizens vote to stop activity it is unaware of? So I wouldn't call that war. I, it's, you know, it's, it's espionage, subversion, influence, right? It's another foreign policy tool. Um, is it more and more? I guess it's more and more online because online is new. But as far as countries trying to influence um, other countries' internal politics, that's, that's not new at all. Um, that's really old. Um, how if it yeah i mean this is always the problem with certain foreign policy things if it's clandestine right how do you vote you know i don't like your espionage strategy you know there is a certain um problem in you know how do you hold things accountable that are clandestine uh i don't think there's a great solution to that uh but you know the public could think broadly about um you know orientations right so leaders orient you know what would that then maybe imply what they would do in the clandestine sphere um, but yeah, it's a little bit hard to, to vote on things that you can't see. I, let me jump in on that. It's, it's not, I, I agree with everything Zach just said, uh, but sometimes these things are, are driven by exogenous factors that have nothing to do with uh, the sort of the policy community in some sense. We just have to deal with the situations. So for example, a lot of the problem now in this area is because there's dual use systems that are used for civilian and military use and or that, that now are economic and civilian and use. And when you start intertwining things, what you attack, what you don't becomes difficult. Uh, uh, one of the best papers I ever did in grad school was about civil war tactics. And if you think of like Sherman, nobody ever ripped up trains or went through the South before because there, were, there weren't the infrastructure to have that. You had, you know, it, we're now fighting on different fights, fronts and competing in different fronts that involve the civilians as well as the military and everything is overlapping. And it's gonna be very difficult to separate out uh, force and uh, uh, national policy from national economic policy from domestic policy, because there are a lot of transnational global things. 
And I think that limiting things in some ways to what Zach was talking about, which is pretty hardline, old fashioned use of force uh, in, in conventional ways as a way of bounding the subject is a very good and useful way to keep the situation focused on the kinds of dovish things he's talking about uh, very specifically in terms of major military conflict. Ivan Savak, who I think you know, Zachary. I do. He says, he asks, what role does part partisanship play in adopting a dovish policy? Is this easier or harder for Republicans or Democrats? Does this depend on the strategic issue at stake? So it's, it, yes, it, it, uh, even asks a good question here. I, I think partisanship tends to undermine doves more than hawks. Um, that doves have a tendency historically to be on not in the middle of the American political spectrum. They, they can be, but I think oftentimes you'll find them, um, say, among libertarians or more on the left. And so sometimes they get the divisions that they have between themselves and other issues undermines their ability to work together on, on foreign policy. Not always, but it can. Um, you might argue that a cons I don't know that you might argue that a conservative could make a more dovish argument, sort of like the Nixon could only Nixon could go to China kind of thing that if you have a reputation, um, but I'm not sure that's true. I, I think it should be possible for politicians across the spectrum to advocate for more peaceful foreign policy um, successfully. The key is they have to then advance what else they're gonna do, um, right? You know, what tools are they gonna use? What policies are they gonna have to advance things? But partisanship undermine, right now in the United States undermines you know, a lot of things, right? It's just very, very hard for Democrats and Republicans to work together on a whole range of issues given the partisan environment. So in that sense, of course, it, it would undermine things. Um, a question from Yu Aoki, who says he's your grad student. He is. He says, or she, sorry, I don't know. He, in discussing whether to intervene or not, one way for the Hawks to win a policy debate is the US has to intervene in order to defend US credibility, which has historically resulted in overextension of the United States. How do you address this powerful but potentially dangerous argument? So, yeah, in the book, I go through this a bit. The active use of force, I'm not, unless you, obviously you have to use force. If you say, I'm going to defend someone, they're attacked, your credibility hinges upon using, using force to defend them. Uh, that said, I don't think actually going out and looking for fights enhances your credibility at all, right? So the, the, no one believes the U.S. is more likely to defend its NATO allies or South Korea because it invaded Iraq than they did before. I think a great telling story of this is right during the Vietnam War, the European allies were begging the US to get out. They didn't think you know, that leaving Vietnam was gonna encourage the Soviets to run through the Fulda Gap in the West Germany. Um, they thought, no, being in Vietnam is distracting you. Please come back and pay attention to us. So I don't think there's a need um, to go out and actively use force. And in fact, you might argue it undermines your credibility in the sense that if you go and use force and you get yourself in a quagmire and then you got to leave, well, now you're actually looking irresolute. Where if you never went in to begin with, right, you don't have to leave Vietnam if you don't go into Vietnam. You don't have to leave Iraq if you don't go into Iraq. And so I don't think running around getting into fights enhances credibility. I think it actually um, sets you up to, to, to look weak ultimately, you know, you know, or irresolute. And so I think it's far better. Um, I guess, right, to keep your powder dry, reserve it, and then use it. Um, obviously, if you, if you make deterrent threats, that if you, know, if you say, if you attack my friend, I'll defend him, you have to do that. But I don't think it has to go beyond that. So I, this is good. I think part of the problem here is a time and consistency issue, which is the Dubs argument basically is don't, you know, take a hit now in terms of letting something happen in the world that you do not want to see happen, except an outcome that is suboptimal that you did not want to accept because the costs ultimately of trying to stop that outcome and reverse it will be much greater. Yeah. And they're asking you to pay the price right up front because everybody can see if you don't do anything, if you accept Zach's thing and you turn the other cheek or you avoid the thing or you do not rise to the bait, then the bad outcome that you have to accept, you have to accept it right there. Yes. The Hawks say, we don't have to pay a price because we can stop this because we'll actually get it and get it back and more on top. 
And what Zach is saying is they're using faulty discounting and bad planning, and they're selling a thing because the costs of the Hawk case are back-ended costs. And the public doesn't have a good way of calculating, especially when they're being lied to or what everything is in the distant future, of discounting and comparing those things. And so they're a sucker for the Hawks case because the costs are, you know, I'll pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger tomorrow, whereas the Dove case involves accepting the compromises now. And that's the biggest problem because what Zach is basically asking people is, look ahead, you're going to be in trouble. Don't take on the credit card debt just because you want to watch The Crown tonight if you can't afford a TV. And, you know, that's not a, a winning argument to politicians or the mobs beseeching them to do something in the short term. Which is, again, why I think you, you can't make the cost argument because it, it sets you up for losing ground. You have to sort of make an argument that these other policies will actually get you this outcome that you want um, better, right? That if you fall back on the cost argument, um, right, the hawks, you put the hawks on, even though I think it's a bad argument, on more favorable ground. Um, but, right, trying to solve every problem is like trying to win every pot in poker. You, you, right, you, you can't do that, right? If you try to win every pot in poker, you go bankrupt really quickly, right? You, you need to fold some to win those pots later um, that you actually have a chance at. It's, it's, it's the same kind of thing, right? If you try to solve every problem, you get yourself into real trouble. Miriam Palma um, asks, about, asks about using the military for humanitarian reasons mentions a few examples. Was the failure to intervene in Rwanda justified, for example? The Obama administration used restraint in Syria, even in the face of war crimes by the Assad regime, but left an opening for growing Russian influence in the Middle East. Was that the right choice? So I do, th so I'm reluctant to use force for humanitarian reasons. I do think genocide's an exception. Um, I think much like you don't wanna plan your overall foreign policy around World War II, you don't want to plan your overall humanitarian strategy around Rwanda. Rwanda is 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 a is a big outlier. Um, I think there's you can say you know you should do something about Rwanda, but you shouldn't necessarily send the military every time there's a humanitarian problem. I I, I would I would put genocide in, in a in a special category where okay you know maybe you got to use force then. Um, I actually would argue that um, Obama not um, intervening in Syria was was, was smart. Uh, right? Yes, bad things happen to Syrians. Um, since we've sent U.S. troops and have, you know, bad things have still happened to Syrians. Uh, you think, okay, the Russians' influence in the Middle East has increased. That's true. It had waned from where it had been before. Um, they, they basically have, the Syrians are their friend. Um, their friend is a fairly weak friend um, that they are spending money to prop up, and they get a military base, a naval base out of it. Um, you can't stop Russian influence everywhere. Right. If your goal is to not let the Russians have any great power influence outside of maybe Russia and maybe their immediate narrow abroad, you're setting up a task that's going to be very, very hard to achieve. And how is the U.S. worse off that the Russians have a naval base in Syria? W what has this done to us? Nothing. It, maybe it's good for the Russians. Good for the Russians. Um, maybe, you know, maybe it's bad for the Lebanese. I don't know. Maybe it's not, I, but it hasn't harmed the U.S. in any way. Americans aren't any poorer from it. Americans aren't any less safe. Um, American friends aren't any less safe. So the Russians have a naval base in Syria. I, I, I can live with that. Um, just a couple more, if that's all right. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, Martin, Martin Amder says, isn't encouraging democracy not only an American value, but also better for our defense? Hasn't history demonstrated that authoritarian regimes have been more warlike? Sure, uh, I'm, I'm all for encouraging democracy. I'm not in favor of using force to impose democracy on other countries. So, right? so there's, a, there's a very big difference between um, right, uh, condemning coups abroad, um, giving aid to uh, emerging democracies, encouraging your friends who may be moving the wrong direction, um, you know, sort of, you know, soft, you know, authoritarianism, place like Slovakia or, or, or Hungary or something, to not do that, um, to put real political pressure, economic levers on them, and saying, I'm going to overthrow Gaddafi and Saddam and try to impose a regime there. So, I, I, you know, it's, there's, there's somewhere in between invading Iraq 
in just saying, I don't care. I, I think the US should promote democracy. Um, but again, we have these other tools, um, institutions, economic levers, diplomatic pressure. Um, they're slow. They can be frustrating. They are not guaranteed to work, um, but also neither is force. Uh, you know, how are we feeling about democracy in Afghanistan, which we've tried to use force for 19 years, and there's a decent chance as soon as we leave, it's, it's you know, what very imperfect democracy is there is going to collapse. So I, I don't, I think, again, it's this temptation that, well, since we, we want to promote democracy, therefore we have to use force to do it. And I, I, don't, I don't agree with, the, with that conclusion that we have to use force. I actually agree with Zachary on this. And I think at this point in particular, at this moment of all times, uh, any American who is speaking internationally or to foreign audiences or global audiences or public audiences and talks about democracy or democracy promotion with a straight face is kidding themselves. Right now, America is a poster child for illiberal democracy. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea that we have any moral authority, the democracy does, liberal democracy does, everyone's wondering why we abandoned it. So the idea that we know can and will promote uh, liberal democracy abroad in a significant way, uh, as we have lost the taste for it at home, uh, uh, it strikes me, you know, uh, the humility and the checking of imperial moral privilege and virtue signaling uh, that we tend to do as a nation is it fully in keeping with the restraint that Zach was talking about. In power, yeah, the power of, of, of example and pra good practice at home is often far more powerful than running around trying to tell people what to do. Last question from Stephanie Golub. We have seen in the past election that there may not be a consensus on how to define American values. What domestic coalitions are necessary to support a values-led foreign policy that sees restraint in the use of force as optimal and thereby win the policy argument. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. What's interesting, and, and it maybe wouldn't hold, um, you know, the, the surveys are a couple of years old, but you actually had fairly broad, you know, like 70 some percent or more of Americans saying they favored the use of international law. They favored multilateralism over unilateralism. Um, they thought the US should be as restrained in the use of force. What's interesting is, is you see this actually with a, with a, a poll that was taken this week in a poll that was taken last week. So poll last week, uh, the vast majority of Republicans said Biden won the election fair and square. Uh, this week, that number fell sub sub substantially. And so what will often happen is partisans will take their cues from elites in their own partisan camp. And so I actually think there's maybe more overlap on a lot of these values um, than one might think. If you, I mean, look, for instance, if you just sort of read a George W. Bush speech, and you read uh, a Barack Obama speech, and you and you just were you know maybe looking at the values articulated in those speeches, uh, especially for foreign, they're going to look pretty similar. Um, I you know I you might so I I think there's maybe more common ground there, if at least on things that would be sort of very broad as far as um, you know human rights, democracy, rule of law, things like that. Obviously, we're having some issues with that at home. I, I'm a, maybe I'm being optimistic in, in thinking this is not a, a long-term turn away from um, values that Americans have embraced for a very, very long time. Um, perhaps I'm wrong there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a domestic policy expert. But I think there's actually more common ground potentially there than, than the recent US domestic politics might indicate. Well, this has been an excellent discussion. We're just about out of time. Thank you both. And thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, do you have any final words or thoughts before we sign off for the evening? Just appreciate um, uh, Gideon, uh, these questions and, and acting as uh, moderator and, and all the questions from the audience. And I'd just like to say thanks to you guys. Uh, Roosevelt House is doing great stuff. You know, the I've come to think Again, I would not have thought this when I was younger. I've come to think that the Roosevelt administration, both in its foreign and domestic policies, was not just on to a lot of serious good policy stuff, but was infused with, they walked the walk, didn't just talk the talk. If you look at Roosevelt's fourth inaugural, 
He knew he was dying. He knew that he had a brief little bit of time left and he tried to sum up the uh, lessons he'd learned. And it was basically what we would now talk about as some kind of liberal international team oriented multilateralism in which we led a group of good guys for common ends, blending our own and others self interests together in a harmonious thing. It was, it was a vision for a foreign policy that was not just in sync with what Zach was talking about, uh, but they actually believed it. And in many cases, in some big things for their day, they implemented some good things. And they, the more I come back to all this stuff now, and Roosevelt House is a wonderful place to have discussions like this, because these kinds of ideas will only get into national policy when they are espoused with a combination of intellectual rigor practical relevance and sent with wings on a discourse of reason out there in the public uh, uh, sphere. And that's what Roosevelt House and Barnard and Zach and Jennifer and all of you guys are doing. And I'm delighted to be a part of it. And I, I'm too old to think it will work, but I'm too optimistic to, uh, to believe that it won't. That's beautifully said, Gideon. Thank you so much for that. Um, and once again, thanks to all our attendees. With that, good night.